are here amongst us. Well, uh, as a soldier, I can always say that, uh, well, it's uh, very easy to say that we did it or I did it. Well, to be honest with you, did nothing. I just stand before you for all what my men did. And uh, it would be wrong even if I were to take even an iota of the credit of what the men could do. Because it is they who allow us, it is they who do it, the seniors who guide you, your colleagues who help you, and the men who ensure that the work is done. So we are, not, we are one of those who just happened to be there by coincidence. If it was not me, anybody else in the army would have been able to execute their task. It is just that at that point of time when you require people and uh, you know you have to go to see whether you have been able to do it or uh, one among them available that you, know, they do, you have given a task and you do it. So I don't think I have so many seniors sitting over here <coughs> And all of them will agree with me that it's just sheer uh, coincidence and opportunity that comes one way and that today we stand as heroes, which is nothing. And, uh, and my commander there was a very fine man. He no more, just passed away, Brigadier uh, Channa. And he would tell me, he Sanjay, remember all these kind of glories that come are like a bubble. Abhi aega, Don't let it ever enter your head. And I kept that as the back of the mind every time throughout. I said, never, ever say can. It was very nice, even within the army circles also. This operation uh, remained almost like a secret operation for many years. Then we were now, of course, it's out in the open to be discussed and we generally say. Otherwise, they do it as an operation, it remains still a, a classified operation. So, having uh, heard some of you who have heard Amit. As to how, what is the process and how we went about it. Uh, I can just about tell you in a nutshell. It was in 1982, uh, or I'll go a little behind. In uh, 1977, I was commissioned. And uh, having done my wires, uh, you know, when you're a youngster in the battalion, and you're told whichever course comes, and the course came high altitude warfare school, uh, and you go to the mountain warfare. So I, I mean, just come back from commandos, they said, now you go for mountain war. So I went for mountain war. And there the commandant was Colonel Hill Kumar. Uh, Colonel Hill Kumar and, uh, 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 say, I'm from the same regiment. So having been from the same regiment, you find someone such a fantastic mountaineer. He also is no more. He passed away two years back. Fantastic mountaineer, and he would be called Bull. Both because of his nature, because of his boxing, power which he had with Jerry Roderick, when he was in NDA. So he has been called both since then. A wonderful uh, person. So since he was a commandant, he was very busy. And it was the year 1978. And as part of the course, we also had to climb some peaks. So we were being taken to a peak in a lake of the Stoke Kangri. Kangri means uh, that particular area, the highest peak. So that's where we were to climb. And we had uh, with us Colonel Kumar also come along and we took and after training over there. But suddenly when we reached Leh, he branched off from us and uh, we found out that the commandant was missing and in no one. He had gone to a place called then we didn't know it, Siachi. And uh, he went there. And why he went there was because one of his Montana friends, a German friend, who he had met and one of the river rafting expeditions. And uh, he showed him a map. And that map uh, revealed that the area that they got to the communication was felt in Pakistan. And how come uh, he's not taking permission from us and is openly saying that he's wanting to go to and climb that particular peak over there? So we saw that and he asked the friend of his. Uh, would you mind giving his map to him? So he said, no, I have got only one map with me. He said, no, no, I'll give you 500 rupees. Those days. He said, uh, but why are you a dear friend? He said, 
in case of because I said I want it, but I will pay you 500 rupees. Please take this 500 rupees and now give it the back. Now from there starts the story of this gas inflation. Because when he took the map, obviously he mulled over it and he found that there's something amiss in this entire map and that the place that he was to go, he ought to have been taking sanctions from the government of India and why was he taking, well, how come he was going there taking the sanction of the government of Pakistan. That's what hooked him and uh, when he saw, he saw that what some of you heard this morning, point NJ9842, that's where in the Karachi agreement, the demarcation and the last point had been done. Because there are three things known as the delimitation, delineation and demarcation. Now all this, Jan Bhatia, who retired as the DGMO, they are the ones who really do it. And they are responsible for ensuring all of it. Because once you know that delimitation, that you know that you really need now to uh, sort of be able to, the intent is clear that you want to give up. Uh, when you say the limitation, then you know that the whole thing will be marked on the map, like uh, what we have, the McMahon line, is delimited, but not demarcated. When you say demarcated, you go on the ground and ensure by putting pillars and so a certain part of a boundary uh, demarcated. So we know both the countries and the representatives are there on both the sides and it's demarcated the border. So this particular thing beyond NGA 9842, nothing was said, it was the last of this area which had been there, and they said the line joining then northwards. Now this particular line which was to <coughs> then northwards was the bone of contention. Now that is where the whole thing started, because when we saw that map, there was a map line drawn, what was shown uh, was made by an American called Hudson. He joined NGA 9842 straight with Karakaram Pass, not with an intention to help anybody, with a basic premise of the ABIZ, the new one. Have that, it gets easier for pilots to be able to fly around and to see things that better. They cross over where if they have to, or otherwise a straight line was drawn. Otherwise, the general in mountains, you don't have a straight line. It will go along the crest line, and the general principle followed is the watershed. And that is where, again, we have the same problem with China on the McMahon line, the watershed principle. We believe in the watershed, it is generally accepted the world over, the top all along. That is on one side of it is uh, us, and the other side is the other side. But certain countries like China, when they want to fool around and play around and want to uh, use it differently, they go at the base of that particular feature. Whereas internationally it is accepted the top ridge line that goes around. So point AK9842 line going along you know, dead southwards meant going towards long the Saltoro ridge line, whereas it got joined straight to the Karakoram Pass. And the Karakoram Pass is the place where we have an identified boundary pillar between India and China. And had this line gone and joined, so we have a tri-junction where all the three countries have met, which suited both Pakistan and China, but it didn't suit us. Now in this context when it was being done, adjoining it is what we call the Shaksdam Valley. And the Shaksdam Valley was ceded <coughs> by Pakistan to China in 1963. Now when it was ceded, the boundary dispute between Pakistan and China got dissolved. And the Punza Valley and the Shaksdam Valley, which when you stand on Indra Kod, which I could not do it as a uh, when in 1984 <coughs> or even in 1982 when I was there, I could very well see, but I could see the Shakstar Valley when I was back again there as a chief of staff of looking for and you have to fly over in the pole, the Shakstar Valley is very clearly seen. You can see the green grass, you can see the valley. Now that Shakstar Valley which is running along has the place called the Punjara Park, which comes from Xinjiang province of China. Xinjiang means a new uh, area, and that's how the Chinese have called Xinjiang. And the Xinjiang, from there comes the Punjara Pass, there is there, and fly, comes the Karakoram Highway. Now that Karakoram Highway comes along that and then joins, of course, now we have the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, which runs along the Gizit Pakistan, Skardu, and goes and joins Wada. So this is the interest of China, which is adjoining in the area of Gilgit Pakistan. This is now. Now this area, 
when we read even uh, Musharraf's book, In Line of Fire, he mentions it that he was a colonel then in the, his uh, MO branch. And when he was a colonel in the MO branch, he had even earlier times after the 1971 war, he said, since he was a captain those days, he was sent towards the Karatara of Ayrin to go and see. It took about 10, 15 days, he writes in his book, how he went about it, such beautiful place, there that and everything all about. But then later on, in 1983, he was posted in the MO branch. He says in his book, he was approved as a brigadier. And since he was approved as a brigadier, he was passing time again in the MO branch. He writes very clearly that his senior, who was there over there, was not a very inspiring man. And therefore, his tenure there was not as good as he expected. But he heard around that time that there's a lot which is happening in Siachen and that something is uh, going around. But he was not fully familiar, but he knew what was there. At that point of time, time Jaldar Khan, who was then the ten, ten core commander, had said that their interest in Siachen particularly would have meant coming a little later. Having done that, and in 1982, if I go back again, we were as part uh, uh, of the battalion which had just then moved to a place called Turtuk. Now, Turtuk is one place which is part of Dilti <coughs> uh, which was captured by us in 1971. And that is why the problem that uh, Amit we have told you all in the morning that as part of the Karachi agreement, the NGA 9842 has some other area. And subsequently, as part of some similar agreement, NGA 9842 stand. But all other areas, there's a little difference because Kurtuk was not part of uh, the Karachi agreement. Because when we captured it, obviously the line went a little more. And then from Kurtuk again, it came back to a place called Chalunka. And from Chalunka, then it ran right up to NGA 9842. And that's where it finally terminated there. And after that, it said, then not work. So this particular dispute, which was there. So in 82, uh, since I happened to be there as part of the advance party, because the battalion was in Dehradun, and then he moved as, uh, to take over the area of Turtuk. Before Turtuk, we were two in battalion, and that's where uh, what to familiarize with battalion. And from the battalion, then I moved to Turtuk. Now this was a new area. Those days, of course, today we have good roads, good communication. Those days, most of the time, uh, the droppings would be so anybody and everybody is serving over there, the food must be dropped because there was no road connected. We got only had mules going up till the, that particular place. So in 1982, the Ladakh scout had been told that they would be patrolling this area of Siachen on the long range patrol, which is the LRP. A duration would be approximately about 90 days. Now this interest of uh, after Colonel Kumar had gone there in 1978, he went again in 1981, and then subsequently in 1982. During the interim period, he had interacted obviously with Jal Chibba, who then was uh, called, I think, the Director MO, sir. Am I right? He was Director MO in, as a major general, and he would be as Director MO, and the Chief also was a Kumaoni, Jal Raina. Since Chan Rana was a Kumaoni, Kalin Kumar was a Kumaoni, a good mountaineer, there was a one to one equation with them. So he obviously sent it to Jan Shepard and said, Look, he's got something, please look into what he's saying. So Aving confirmed that yes, Pakistanis are showing interest in this particular area. We need to do something to be able to occupy it also. So therefore, in 82, as part of exercise, Operation Isaac Hunt, that is uh, long range patrol. Of the Ladakh scouts that went there. And since I was there as part of the advance party to relieve the Ladakh scouts, so they gave me an opportunity to do aerial reconnaissance, aerial reconnaissance of that area. And I got to know as to what Siachen Glacier is all about. It's 76 kilometer long, approximately about 2 to 8 kilometers wide, and about 300 meters in depth, and uh, runs long from where the snout of the Nubra is. Now, this Nubra River joins that Khalsa, the show, which in turn then goes and joins Indus, which goes to Skargu, and from Skargu, obviously, into Pakistan and joins the Indian Ocean. So, that is where the whole uh, this thing about uh, this particular river that uh, Pakistan is in. So, 82 we did that. And, but before 82, when Colonel Ling Kumar was uh, on this Yachin River, the Pakistan, they say, 
and then the Pakis flew the saber jets on it and also brought the helicopters up there, only to tell him that this area is ours. So the first time, as uh, it was around 1983, <coughs> that Pakistanis firstly sent a note to at Kargil, and that is where uh, the, the note left by the Pakistanis was the area that your troops are moving around belongs to us and not to you because the line joining NGA 9842 joins the Karakara Pass. So that was the first time the intentions were quite clear that the Pakis were now using what the Americans thought would be otherwise uh, as part of the ABIZ. But they thought, okay, since Pakistan was part of CETO, part of CENTO, so it doesn't matter if Pakistan is to be held. But notwithstanding having uh, said that, so when Colonel well, Kumar inducted, thereafter we took regular patrols on to the Asian So this is where that was in 1982, then 1983. In 1983, since I had done the area because of the uh, glacier, 83 I was told that I would be the patrol twice since I was a young <coughs> captain with just about five years of service. So they said you will be the two IC for this particular patrol and the one who had led the earlier one, the IDEX hunt, he would be the patrol leader. But then uh, when, since you are the patrol leader and one of the uh, normal movement along the glacier, he twisted his ankle. So since he twisted his ankle, obviously <coughs> it, he was re-inducted and then I was made the patrol leader. In 83 when we were doing the patrolling on it, uh, it was very nice, it was to be a 90 days since we've gone there in the month of June. And uh, we realized that at Bella Ponda, in one of the petrol there, we found some uh, soda water packets. Now the soda water packets had markings on it, which were definitely, I could at that stage of <coughs> age and service, identify which country did it belong to. So then uh, we said that there are some packets, but the uh, Language looks like Chinese, and that is where it is all about. And we passed the radio message back that we found some wrappers with Chinese markings on it. However, there weren't Chinese markings, there were <coughs> Japanese markings. Because the Japanese script and the Chinese script are quite uh, you know, very familiar, very identical kind of script. And there, those days I didn't know. Of course, today I can make out for which one is Japanese, which one is Chinese, and which one is Korean can be identified today. But those days I didn't know it. So anyway, it was clarified. Now, when we said that the rapper that we found on top of the picture, we came back. And we found I had a very senior officer come to me on the glacier and asked uh, me, where did you find this? I said that on the top of Bella Fonda and where and how and everything. Now the officer who had come was young Robert. Now he is the father of the CDS who later passed away, Bipin Robert. That he was a jungle those days, and he came because he was serving in that area. And he said, How come Chaam Mila Kaise Hua? and all those inquiries, and he said, Okay, fine, and he left. So that was the first time the indication that Patriot came. So now the parties were quite clear that we were moving on the Siachen Glacier. Since we were moving on the Siachen Glacier in 1983, in 1983, around the same time, as part of Polar Bear 1, that we were there, as part of Polar Bear 2, which uh, again, I may have mentioned it in the morning. Now, again, when the polar bear took to place, it was the need to be able to show that this area belongs to us. So we had paint, we had brush, uh, brush with us, we had some huts which were to be uh, any dropped over there, constructed at a place called the Kumar Base. Now, Kumar Base is a place which is named after Colonel M. Kumar, Bull Kumar, as I said about It's in the center, virtually, about camp, between Camp 3 and Camp 4 center, where you hear now a lady officer was uh, now stationed over there who would tend to spend 90 days on the glacier. One of the lady officers who decided to volunteer herself, a nice uh, tough girl who was down there, that's called the Kumar Bay. Now the Kumar logistics way in the center, they decided. Now when we de-inducted, the Pakistanis inducted. When the Pakistanis inducted, we again re-inducted. And then there were both uh, movement taking place around uh, you know, the Sachin Glacier. But we having done our job, we fell back. The Pakistanis decided to stay on the glacier, thinking that the Indians have gone back, we will now stay on the glacier and let us see. They hardly had stayed for 10 days, and that it became so extremely cold. Because the temperatures dropped, 
as you go later in the month of September or October, this is polar bear 2 in the month of September. So the temperatures drop drastically from what it otherwise would be during day. You could have about 2 degrees, uh, sometimes going as high as 10 degrees temperature during day. But at night it would drop to minus 20, minus 30, like that. And since the temperature is around then it was extremely, extremely bad. It goes about minus 30, minus 40. The Pakistanis hadn't probably planned on such uh, uh, kind of severe <coughs> weather conditions. So they beamed up. Now the person who was then at this point of time in Pakistan, that's uh, very important, was General Ziaul Haq, who was then the president. And General Akta uh, was the DGISI. Now DGISI that he was, he was the DGISI from 1979 till 1987. Ziaul Haq died in the air afternoon. Now this man who was there and at that point of time uh, was aware of what was going on. He probably uh, told General Zia at that time that Indians are coming on and off what was to be done. So he said we will occupy Siachen. So you suggest go and buy token from Europe. So on the directions of there, they picked up the token from Europe and were all set to be able to occupy Malaysia, which they could not do in 1983. They thought they would do it in 1984. And 1984 plans were that they would occupy it in the month of March, but then uh, the uh, said that it would not be possible for them to occupy it in the month of March. They would do it then, he said, they would do it in the month of May, because Indians invariably come in the month of June. So before they come in the month of June by May, we would have already occupied the Saltoro ridge line and the glacier, and so it would not be very difficult. You would have three years there. Now, having done that, we realized that uh, the Pakistanis having done that, and when the moon went there, we found that uh, difficult, but anyway, he gave orders to some of the firms in Europe that he would want it uh, at a specific date. Now, when in one of the uh, discussions that uh, happened, uh, John Chimber, who was the army commander. He uh, asked me, because I was born in 83, he said, uh, Sanjay, uh, would you be able to use the same equipment if the equipment doesn't come from abroad, for whatever the reason it may be? So I said, yes, I, since I have gone there, in 82, I saw uh, the dark scouts wearing the same equipment which was made in India. And uh, in 83, we had the same equipment which was issued by the army, same Balkrava, the same jackets, ECC clothing and everything. I said, we should be able to do it. But uh, having said that, he said, okay, uh, if you think you can do it, because we intend pre-phoning it. Now, when he said intend pre-phoning it, I didn't understand much at that time as a captain what he meant and what was in his mind. So when I said, yes, it will be done, so he told John Hood, so I hope the equipment comes by this day. But should it not, then we stick to it. Now, because Channa was the ninth sector commander, <coughs> He was under uh, this thing, he said, uh, sir, we intend uh, occupying Glacier on the 13th of April 1984. So he said, why on the 13th of April? He said, sir, it's Vaisakhi and it's a uh, good uh, this thing to do. And I'm confident since it's celebrated in Pakistan, it's celebrated in India, it will be a uh, day where generally people will be black, will launch the operation. He was also told that 13th is an unlucky day. He said, say, it will be unlucky for Pakistan. <laughs> so, with that kind of a document, we have a Now, you have to really understand sometimes, you know, these kind of things, uh, I find it a rare coincidence. Now, because Channa were Kashmiri, General Hood also, Mrs. Gandhi also, and there was General Paul, who was then the Deputy Chief uh, in the Army headquarters, and General Reinhardt. So, they were all just netting what you call it. It was very easy for him to go about the things. Like that. And Jan Moon had known Mrs. Gandhi very well because of the operation in Sikkim. And the operation in Sikkim were conducted. He was the uh, advisor there. And he knew everything, uh, Chogya there, everyone there, Mrs. Gandhi there. So there was a one to one connection that were there. They knew how to go about it. So he said, there is no problem. So 13th April was decided firm that we will now launch operation on 13th April. It was okay. Now, as uh, we are all ready to launch, 12th of April, 11th of April I went for a recce, 12th of April I went for a recce of the glacier, perfectly fine, very good weather, very clean weather, but nobody, and uh, the direction of the path, that don't open the radio sets, and uh, we were very clearly told, don't open radio sets, because the moment you open radio sets, 
there, you will be yes. no always to see your location. So, total radio silence. And after the operations are on, for minimum five days, there will be total uh, radio silence. So, Air Marshal Mullins was the Western Air Command, uh, uh, and he came there. And he said, don't do why and impact us all up, along with the Jabbar. He said, my choppers will come in the morning, and uh, they will take you all up on the uh, glacier, and everything. No, no, everything was all okay, but no equipment. The equipment tried, the first April, uh, it's almost, it's because by the time all the senior officers came to give a pet talk to us, it was around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and suddenly nobody flies there after 12. But there were some very senior officers, they knew that how to get back to the air, whatever time. But around 5 o'clock in the evening, we suddenly heard the then V8 coming in, huge battles, everything coming in. My God, what is all this? So this equipment got done running and gone, but we managed to scratch it up and ensure that it reaches us for the 13th April operation at 3 by 12th evening. So it reached us on the 12th of evening. And on the 13th of the evening, we launched it. So when all this uh, thing was going on, so the choppers that had come, they were being flown by the Air Force pilots. So when we talk of jointness, we talk of, of integration, all of it is there. You, you find, you know, the kind of gelling of it, you find all of this. Even though we, are, we used to have a lot of Air OP pilots flying around uh, there with us, and it was wonderful. But the operations at that point of time for this induction, the task was given to the Air Force, and then the Air Force pilots flying all these uh, uh, Cheetah helicopters. I remember Scott Miller, Bain, the serving commander, Sandhu, uh, BRC, they were all there in the morning and they said they would take us around. And he had taken me on the day before to show me everything. So when he reached to the top of the glacier, and uh, we were there, I was with my operator, the bundle, there were some signals, and we were using the radio set on his lap. It was a very heavy uh, kind of a radio set because it required uh, kind of a different kind of communication. And I had another helicopter uh, which was to fly, see and tag along uh, behind this uh, helicopter. We had another boy, one Lance Hank, uh, Ramit, and another one was uh, Lance Hank Prakash. These two boys, they are there. Now, both these boys were with me in 1983. So I was familiar, except for this boy. We did training for last about three, four months, going about, obviously, we knew if we were going to be there on the glacier at any point of the year, what kind of training is required, how we have to survive, what is to be done. We have to have a good uh, gel, nice uh, body system that was there. So when we reached uh, Siachen and reached Bela Pata, we were tasked as part of four more, the platoon was tasked to occupy Bela Pata. And yet another platoon was tasked to occupy Siachen. And there was nothing, no talk of the area of Yongla at that point of time, because there was these three passes, Yongla, Belafonda, Siala, or a stretch of 76 kilometers. From where the, a pass, the large in the pass, from where you can enter and cross the Solsolo race and come into the Piaget glacier. Now, these three passes, generally the mountaineers use the center pass, and that was Belafonda. Because Yongla was a little off, the Siala was extremely difficult, almost like 19,000, very difficult, it's closer to Indra Road. So, the center pass, that was Villa mm, Fonda, which is generally used. So we were told that Villa uh, Fonda would be occupied first, Siala would be occupied later, and then the Gaunda would be occupied third. Now, when on uh, uh, the 13th in the morning, when we all went, uh, all these choppers, so the chopper, the pilot told me, sorry, uh, Sanjay, can't uh, land because uh, we are not too sure. Why he said that was? Because there are crevices on the mm -hmm. And those crevices are generally covered by light snow. And then since it is covered with this light snow, you can't really make out when the, the pilot lands that the import will happen because it happened when I, uh, it happened when I was the chief of staff there. And the entire uh, ALH, the new shopper that you saw uh, on the screen, had got inside the crevice. Can you imagine? And nowhere, it was not very really far, but at near Bella the entire chopper, I couldn't imagine when I flew in there to, uh, when they told me that the chopper to the chopper to pull a crevice me chala gaya. Crevice me chala gaya. Kaisi chala gaya. When I went there, literally I saw, fortunately the pilots were safe. But the whole chopper, you can imagine, went inside. Because when the pilot was there, landing, there was a whiteout condition. There was so much of loose clothing, he didn't know what was happening, everything all whiteout. And we landed, tuck, 
okay, he said, he okay, landed on top of a planet. So this, this to avoid this kind of a thing, on the 13th, the pilot told me, hey, I'm sorry, I'll not be able to land, you jump there. I said, okay, I'll jump. There's no problem with jumping. But I said, now I would also not know where I am jumping. It should so happen that I also jump and I don't think. It didn't matter. So I told him, I said, very matter. You over low. And uh, there was a small Ateka Bori with me under because each one of us was self contained. So in my this thing, I put that Ateka Bori. I tell you, sometimes problems. So I told him, I push this down. If it doesn't sink, that means it's quite hard, I'll jump. If it sinks, then we look for another place for me to jump. They said, okay, no problem. So we saw that area. They said, in this area, we were about mm, approximately about two or kilometers short of Bella Fonda. He said, I'll drop you here. I will not go on top of Bella Fonda. I'll drop you short of Bella Fonda. Then you all walk from there. I said, no problem at all. So we low over. I jumped after the jury was thrown up. And it was perfect, no problem. I gave a thumbs up to the pilot. I said, perfect, no problem. I walked around everywhere. He took off. He was flying on top. The other ch chopper was also flying on top to see where am I, what am I doing over there. So he saw that back. So then I said, no problem. So he got the chopper down. The radio operator who was with me, Mandal, he got down. And the other chopper which was overseeing what we were doing, he also landed over there. So the operation started off landing. Within about half an hour, you found, I found this little boy, Mandal, uh, you know, not moving. I said, Mandal, we have done three, four of us out of Asia. We have to prepare uh, the other choppers to come in. So, oh, get up there, you've been training with us for the last three months. But he says, kuch nahi kar pa raha. Kuch, kuch I said, what happened? I, I knew from my past experience that this boy seems to have been affected by what happened. It all the high altitude fight money there. You know, you get totally disoriented in water or into your lungs or whatever it is to be. And you feel miserable. So I can't force that boy to do anything. I said, okay, don't worry, he sent me back. But the next flight is done, he will be inducted. So he was inducted in this flight. By about 11, 13 in the morning, all the seven choppers, two in every three chopper, they all landed uh, one by one. So it took about half an hour flying in, another half an hour to go back, and another refueling if it was required, refuel again come back. So it would take about an hour for the so next sorties to come in. About 11.30 from the time we had started, it was over. By about 11.30, the weather turned extremely bad. Unbelievable. I never could imagine the weather would change such a drastically different. What about an hour back was reasonably clear. By 11.30, they had gone back. Because the same chopper was to drop Bahuguna's platoon at Siala. So we have to occupy Bellafonda and Siala on the same day as the 13th of August. But it didn't happen yet. Now, because of the extreme bad weather, so bad, the blizzard is well. The wind started in such speed, you know, something like 100 kilometers an hour. Know, we hadn't pitched tents, we hadn't done anything on the small puff tents that were there, they took car, fold and put it on the ground, uh, on that uh, snow and uh, wanted to stay. Next year, now nothing visible, nothing to be seen, nothing. I said, we yeah, are damn difficult on these young boys. They're all young, uh, 22, 23, 21, yeah. youngsters, all of us over there. Now, Major Sandhu was my country commander. Now, uh, Paramir Yadav was here. As, uh, <coughs> uh, now, Paramir Yadav, uh, he was one platoon commander. And another platoon commander uh, left me to sign. Now, here I had to establish camp one, camp two, camp three, and then establish uh, camp four, and he then came out to the Lapa. Now, the Ladakh scout cartoon which was to occupy was to establish camp 4, camp 5, camp 6, and then to work in Seattle. Now, these camps are one day turnover. That means when you say camp 1, you have to go at camp 1, halt the night over there, camp 2 the next day, camp 3 thereafter, and things like that. Again, for Mount Everest, when you generally climb, Mount Everest is camp 1, camp 2, camp 3, and assault. That means you establish three camps and you assault Mount Everest. But here, on this, we have to establish six camps and then one bifurcation on that, uh, say, Lolo Pond Glacier, going on to Bella Ponda, one more camp in between. Because it's a long uh, stretch. So, all these uh, kind of things were taking time. Well, we found it very difficult. Now, 13th April, we were to uh, occupy Bella Ponda. We were two kilometers short of Bella Ponda and we could not occupy Bella Ponda because every time then we attempted to walk, we would be going waist deep into snow. 
could walk even 100 yards, in, I don't know, two hours. And you find it so difficult to even take ourselves out of the snow and move forward, just leave it on the track. So I fell back. Now, 15th, we attempted, finally, it was 13th, dark weather. 14th, extremely bad weather. We couldn't even step out. 15th, extremely bad weather. Now, these pup tents can take two feet and max. And at the most three. Uh, because of the only, if you have to only sleep, it can't take more than that. And they're all important, lovely important equipment which uh, General Hoon kind of to see at the hindsight they feel. It's not for that bad. We do all will have probably died. Because uh, as youngster, you know, you don't know, but uh, the senior officer, he knew exactly as to what the requirements would be. So he, uh, those tents which came, we picked up the tent. Now in that particular tent by 15th, when uh, 16th morning we were going on to Belafonda, we got some about uh, 500 yards and we were still come back. What happened, come back. So we came back uh, and when the Sandhu then told me to look, uh, Ramesh is no boy. I said, what happened to Ramesh? He said, looks uh, no more because his cloth in his mouth and he's not reacting that he's, he's dead. So I said, he sat. And this boy was with me in 1983. And this boy was, uh, I asked him in the morning, you want to go to uh, this thing? He said, yeah, yeah. In the night, he said, yeah, yeah, I'll come with you all to Bela Fonda. But in the morning, no. So that particular day again, now we could not go to Bela Fonda because Now the problem arose, as I said, in one pub tent, because you could only two, maximum three. Now one among them is dead. Now if one among them is no more, you can very imagine. How do I make the other two chaps sleep inside the tent or keep their body out there? I said, no, that's not that. But this is only the third day. Now, five days was radio silence. Now, what is to be doing now? I said, we can't keep animation body outside. Neither can we have inside. Nor can I put these two chaps. Nothing that I have. I told Sandhu, you know, I said, doesn't matter. Let's open the radio station and we'll, uh, inform them that such a tragedy has happened. And please evacuate. Now, evacuate. Uh, the moment this radio message went down to uh, the base camp, they said they come. Because the one person within about two hours was evacuated because of high altitude, pulmonary or whatever. And here are within three days, one day, so it will be Mushkil over here. Now, Jan Hoon came in the chopper and he didn't land, but from the top he said, what happened? Now, when you're hovering low and you're there, you can easily see each other because of the glass. So, it's not very difficult. So, I told him, I said, what? No more. So, he saw that. He said, don't worry. So before he took off, he dropped a uh, actual black copy and he said, take this. Now, at this point of time, in four days, out of the 13 who were taken uh, on top, we were left with 29 uh, on the very first day. 28 now. And out of this 28 also, about 12 boys had fallen sick on the various, you know, I don't know, people go see they know they are fast by they are insomnia, not able to eat, headaches, all kinds of things. So they were not feeling comfortable because of that bad weather. Now, since the radio set had been opened, this boy had to be evacuated, we decided that all this evacuation would be done. We would move to Belafon. So by the time we moved to uh, Belafon land, I reached the top of Belafon land. And you find the Pakistani, uh, the, the, I think the Lama, uh, something like the Cheetah, on the same kind of a thing. It came right. Now we were on top of Villa and this chap came from there. Now, at 18,500, how high would the helicopter of his plan? A little above us. Really. So he saw me, I saw his eyes, and he sees me. And he saw, my God, so many Indian troops have already landed on top of Villa Fonda. He took a U turn and so now I then we realized how important it was not to open the radio. <coughs> so as soon as the radio set was open, the party caught on the Harkat understand. So they were to occupy the Siachen glacier on the first of June. And this was revealed by Mashara in his book in the line of fire. The first May was the day, though he said that they suggested it should be the first of April. But uh, since first of April would have been extremely cold because of the experience of 1983, they said the, the commander of there said first of May. So they decided to go on first of May. So obviously anybody who is coming to occupy the glacier on the first of May would have to be somewhere close by in Stardew, Kapalu, all that area around the 15th of April. Otherwise they can't come up. 
Now again is in old book you read that from the area that they were climbing all these heights for only one day. For us, it was camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, camp five, camp six, then go down to Bella Poyla, then go down to Siala. It was a seven, eight days experience. And for him, it was one day, had they come down, and they had to just climb up the Sonsoro and then do that. Now that means these people are already there. So when this, the U turn or the chopper took place at that point of time, that was very interesting. Because once that, uh, this thing, and then a little later, uh, I saw a white crow. The moment I saw white crow, I remember the 83, then also one white crow had come. So I said, every time a white crow comes, that means it's following some body of troops. And the, sure enough, the Pakistanis by then had moved to the place called Ali Bramsa. Now from Balafon on top, if you look down, you could see a place about a few kilometers away, but if you uh, on the glacier, you can see miles away. And you could see some movement of people with the binoculars that is Pakistanis and right in the summer. And that was around the, you know, the 17th, 18th of April, 1980.